A warm welcome back to our 273rd show of Think Tech Hawaii's Human Humane Architecture. And thanks to you, Eric, because we can't see it anymore. The accumulated viewer you are is the 14,722nd. So uh, we uh, is uh, our now um, co-host by now, who used to be a guest, uh, who's going to give us the boost of uh, his uh, Boston Banish firm. This is Matt Noblet. Hi, Matt. Hey, Martin. And it's me, Martin Despang, and his Waikiki Grand. And our third leg is joining us soon, who is DeSoto Brown, who is on the way to his Bishop Museum. So we're going to start out uh, without him and get the first slide up. And um, as we had um, promised, uh, Matt, we're going to talk about of your by now large, pretty large body of work. We both decided to uh, zoom in and focus on two exemplary projects. One we just finished last show, uh, which is the Genzyme building. And now we're actually going to Harvard. Uh, you take us there for one of your very recent projects. But again, we want to put it into the context of climate and culture. And uh, this slide here, you had been labeling as comfort. So tell us what's behind the images, what kind of message is behind the images we see. Yeah, well, I mean, one of the things that has always interested us and, and it interested me personally was um, the way in which the introduction of mechanical cooling systems in the first um, part of the 20th century sort of radically changed the way that we think about forming buildings and occupying buildings. And, um, and, the, and in some cases, the really interesting examples are often the buildings that sort of straddle that gap that were built pre-air conditioning uh, and then were largely inhabited post-air conditioning. And the the um, the Flatiron building in New York City is just kind of an like, iconic example, something that everybody sort of recognizes and has in their mind what it looks like. And it's probably more something like what you see in the right hand image here. But if you uh, look at the left hand image, and in fact, if you can sort of zoom in on the, the facade a little bit of the of the building in the black and white photograph, you actually see that each of these windows had little fabric awnings that projected out over them. And um, they were not there simply for the decoration of the outside of the building. They actually were integral to the to the sort of thermal performance of the building. They shaded the glass from the direct sunlight uh, because what happens is when when direct sun hits glass, very much like what you experience in a greenhouse, uh, the ultraviolet rays are trapped behind the glass and they continue to heat up the interior of the building. That heat can't escape. And so uh, you end up exceeding what is sort of a comfortable environment to to occupy. So you see here that people sort of intuitively understood how to design. Um, I mean, I think there's an architectural intention there, but uh, it also is very much in line with the functioning of the building, the proper functioning of the building. Um, eventually, cooling was introduced into this building, and this more contemporary photograph on the right sh shows that as those, what I assume happened was they probably deteriorated to some point, and people say, well, that's no point in putting them back at this point. We can stay cool inside this building without them. Uh, they're there no more, um, but uh, that comes at a very high cost to the environment. It comes at a relatively high uh, dollar cost as well, but energy continues to be you know, somewhat cheap in the U.S., so people don't aren't as sensitive to it, but it comes at a very high cost to our, our planet. Absolutely, and you know, you guys might not think, okay, what in the world does this have to do with us in beautiful Hawaii where there's always summer, <clears throat> and you're freezing over there in Boston, and I go back to Munich in one and a half weeks, mm -hmm. but we here in Hawaii you know, don't have these issues. But uh, the two top pictures there show an example of us here, of our heritage, and that is the Royal Hawaiian, um, the second after the Moana surf rider that DeSoto is the utmost expert on. If you go in there, you will see that most of the images there are from his employer, the Bishop Museum, but there's also a large body of work from his private, uh, the Soto Brown collection. And the second one in, in Waikiki here in, in our hood, uh, where it basically was otherwise a palm grove, was the Royal Hawaiian. And the Royal Hawaiian was built in 1927. And it's basically an imported 
style of architecture, um, which is a word that I otherwise try to avoid, but you know, architectural historians use it for some valid reason. And it's the same because it's a it's a it's a tectonical system that was foreign to to Hawaii here, right? Where they were building basically with sticks and 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 latching and thatching. Here, all of a sudden, stereotomics were introduced to the island because this is a masonry building, and everything was shipped in, which is a problem that we continue to have. But besides that, it borrows from a, a culture somewhere in the in the Arab world with a style, and they have not unsimilar climatic conditions, right? And, mm -hmm. and they kept the fenestrations rather small. So the percentage of holes in the wall, in that stereotomic wall are rather small. And then they are covered with that kind of same awning. So the same kind of strategy, again, in that same era. And the picture on the right um, is uh, what um, I wanted to sort of to talk about, because this is a former colleague and buddy, Jim, who worked with him on in the Bishop Museum. There's a little, uh, very, very sort of antique uh, coming across shop in there that I always wanted to go. And Sammy basically went in there and asked this guy whose name is Jim for a postcard. And we started to talk and he pulled up this one of these uh, books by DeSoto that had DeSoto had signed, which DeSoto didn't remember when we sent it to him. <laughs> but uh, the point is more, there's something else in the image, um, Matt, that we see there that has another sort of similarity and connotation about climate control in the most natural way, right? Yeah, I assume you're talking about the uh, the hats on the wall. <laughs> exactly. The, the wide exactly. rimmed hats. Exactly. And especially us three bald guys, you know, we need them essentially because we don't have any of that naturally grown sun protection anymore on our hats but it's a very simple <laughs> device that again uh with a you know you do with very little uh you know you achieve you achieve a lot so um according to uh my theory or thought that i think the two of the worst things i think the worst things that happened to us here in hawaii is when it's actually one thing, but then it's embodied through two, and they seem to be in correlation with each other. And that is the combustion engine in <laughs> form of moving people around and keeping keep people cool in buildings. And that gets us to the next slide, uh, because this is exactly what's described here in the text. Uh, and I let you talk about the slide because it's yours, but I found it interesting that even in the text, they describe that relationship that they say in order to not hear the explosions of these moving things, uh, mm -hmm. we need to basically keep the windows closed and get ourselves artificially ventilated. And that's pretty absurd, right? But it that is. was the it argument. Is. Well, this was, I mean, sometime around the, you know, say 1920, um, the technology or the sort of the early 20s, the technology for mechanically cooling um, something at the scale of a building really became conceivable, you know, and commercialized uh, to us to a scale that it could that you could um, literally mechanically cool a building of this size. This happens to be one of I don't know if it is really the first. They claimed it was the first building in in Texas that um, was fully cooled. And um, what this really began was a sort of a a long process of defining interior conditions of comfort that were uniform across um you know in the beginning uh, regions uh, ultimately the entire us and then eventually as those kind of standards were adopted internationally really across the globe so this this the, the, the sort of the promise of the cooling the of the cooling um regime was that you could effectively uh deliver the same interior conditions temperature environmental conditions anywhere in the world uh that that you wanted um and of course but, but that was really a regime that was only enabled by the presence of uh cheap energy right that's the the and air conditioning accounts for uh, a, a significant part of the carbon emissions of our of our society today um globally and um it, i think one wonders you know pre 1928 when people had to actually form their buildings in a way to make them comfortable because they didn't have these technical means to do so, um, what was different? 
were people different? Were, was physics different? <laughs> I had this really interesting discussion with a neighbor of your, and I'm talking your home here in Kailua, because yesterday on the beach, I started to talk with some ladies, and one of them actually is and said, you got to come to my home, I need to show you. So she has this sort of 1920s home that she, you know, started to add on and add on to, and you would be very proud of her, and I think we should actually do a show with her, because mm -hmm. she, as a non-trained in our discipline and profession person, did it so perfectly about cross ventilation and I see everything like the 101 of bioclimatic design in the tropics. She just got it right. And she started to be philosophic, <clears throat> philosophical about what you just did as well. And she was tracing back to the Carnegie's, to the Rockefellers, and they teamed up with Hearst and basically said, how can we make this the most profitable for us? And oil seemed to be, you pointed out, to these days, right, where fossil energy is way too cheap still. As, mm -hmm. as one of the, the reasons that keep us back. And, and not to ever excuse this here, but when I'm reading here, refrigerated air in summer and warmed air in winter, um, again, um, if, if you're having one system anyway, and then you can switch seasonally, and, and you have a very you know, much more clever way that we, you will continue to talk about, which is thermally activated surfaces, where you do the same, where you have hoses go through concrete and then you flush a liquid through that goes into the ground and the always stable temperature there is then, you know, in the different seasons doing one or the other. Mm -hmm. Just to remind us here in Hawaii, there is no such thing as winter, at least not the one we're <laughs> talking about, right? So it's even more absurd again here to, if you already have a heating system, that's what I try to say, you know, to say, okay, if I can use this for cooling, that's sort of tempting, right? But that condition we even never had. So let's go to the next slide and show a slide that came to your mind when you think about our climate here and your summers over there in Boston and anywhere else in the 60% other temperate world climates. Yeah, I mean, this is just for me really one of the kind of beautiful examples of, of climate responsive design that's right here in, in, it's actually on the other side of the river from where I am right now in Cambridge. Um, the Peabody Terrace uh, housing, graduate housing complex at Harvard University. Um, it was not a particularly beloved building um, at the time it was built uh, because of its height and its size um, relative to the sort of smaller homes that sort of populate that area. But um, it is actually quite an intelligent building. It has um, internal to the building are elevators that skip every other floor. Um, which uh, allows you to have apartments that go all the way through the um, depth of the building. So it's a relatively thin building from this facade that we see here to the back of that. Um, and all of the apartments can therefore be cross ventilated. So all of the windows at these balconies open up and you can open up the windows at the back of the building and you get fresh air moving through the entire depth of the building. Uh, and then on the outside, um, the architect, Jose, Jose Luis Cert, um, mounted these um, manually adjustable sunshades uh, that are kind of a, it's this kind of brisole, metal brisole that's mounted on the front of the, the concrete building. And users can simply step out onto their balcony and, and rotate those to be in the closed position or the open position, depending on what kind of environment they need to, you know, whether they're trying to block the sun out or whether they want to be able to see you know, up and down the river to the different views or, or block out glare. So it's really a, it's, it's a good example here in a, in a colder weather climate of, of, again, a very similar thing that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And I think I'm hopefully I'm pronouncing her name right. The lady I got to know yesterday from your Hawaii hood in Kailua, Susan Shanahan. She would love this. I have it to send it to her because she explained to me, she as the expert explained her house and she said, you know, I have opening at the bottom and at the top. We talked about this, about Asipov, but this is someone, again, not with a training in our discipline and profession who totally gets it right. Mm -hmm. So this is kind of ironic, right, that in, 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 in Boston, in cold Boston, where the advantages you just described of the building at this moment of the year, you can't even take advantage of, right? But would it be in Hawaii, that would be the case all year round. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, I mean, even building, a day like today, it works fine. It would work fine. It's quite warm it, here, it, actually. It, it, <laughs> it, it works fine, yeah. And you can obviously adjust the louvers in a way that you embrace the sun and then you get passive solar, right? So, yeah, it, mm -hmm. it works in both climates. But 
for us, it would like the work the way you described, like all year round, right? And, and getting to the next slide, it gets us to the next slide because it's not like that ever since 1928, everyone was getting hooked and addicted to the, to the drug of fossil fuel uh, as the examples from the past, because actually uh, until that was fully embraced, took many more decades. We could probably fairly say when, the, you know, Ronnie the cowboy, you know, who was doing commercials, Ronnie Reagan for General Electric, he got literally bribed by the fossil industry and, and became one of their actors, literally and figuratively speaking. Mm -hmm. So really not until the 80s, it really got like fully embraced. And this is way earlier. This is DeSoto's childhood. This is our favorite building, at least what it was. This is the Alamana building that was not designed by Danish architect, although it could have been, because you are, um, which I appreciate, not a, not a commercially driven practice, but a culturally <clears throat> ambitious. And the architect of this building was actually the most commercial architect of its time, John Graham. He built shopping malls and commercial stuff all over. But even he did a building very much, this could be by Surd, or it's in this tradition, right? Because it had louvers. And these louvers were, which then became, I guess it's destiny because that's they used as an excuse to take them off in the 90s, these horrible days where we had to go through architectural education as we keep reminding each other, Matt. <laughs> um, until then, from its beginning, it had these louvers and there were uh, uh, gold uh, anodized on one side and dull aluminum on the other. And then they basically moved with uh, you know, the sun so this became a beautiful, because that's a point, you know, we often talk about the, the performance of the building in a, in a physical way, but you kindly frequently remind us of that we have to talk about the, the performance of beauty just, you know, as well and at the same time. And there's actually this, should be this, and there, there is inherently the potential of a reciprocal relationship between the two, because this building here trying to keep the people in the building cool and by that it basically became this beautiful you know biochromatic kinetic sculpture that looked different at every time of the day because it was just you know moving and engaging with the elements mm -hmm. of course you know again in a, in a mechanical way yes but um that has a lot to do with what you guys do you say we just put as much of technology in there uh, that's still, you know, to be operated by the human being and the human being is in charge of it versus the other way around, which we often say these kind of autistic buildings where just the AC blows, you know, the, the human being doesn't even have the, 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 the technology, the fossil took over and, <laughs> you know, its occupants becomes a slave of that whole system that he, she created, right? Okay, so our next uh, uh, keyword is integration. That gets us to the next slide. And um, yeah, explain us at least the parts that you contributed to the slide. And then I will talk about the one that DeSoto and I threw in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think is, this, these, these kind of keywords um, spring from this talk I gave at the university um, last month or now two months ago. Um, which really, you know, talked about climate as a driving factor behind design, understanding where you're building. Uh, then it talked about uh, comfort, uh, understanding the kind of conditions of comfort and what, um, uh, how you deal with people's expectations and how you um, talk about their ability to to um, to positively influence their environment by, for example, how they dress or how they adjust parts of the the building to to suit their needs. And then integration really becomes about once you've kind of packaged or once you've understood those two first two things, how do you bring them together and then carefully apply technology uh, to solve the parts that are left in the design problem. So the idea here is not to sort of continually layer on technology, just bolting new gadgets onto the outside of the building to solve discrete problems, but really think about the problems through all of these um, important layers to come up with the most efficient solution that you can possibly come up with. Yeah. And uh, the show quote at the top right shows your business partner and founder of the firm, Stefan Banish, here bundled up in the tempered. <laughs> 
And then you choose that picture of that lady. I assume it's a colleague of yours as well. Is that right? It's in fact, his wife. <laughs> oh, it's his wife that I yet have to get to know. So even better. So thank you. Yes. So, and that picture is shows her in in a climate more like ours here all year round. Mm -hmm. And that's also why we choose this project that you will share with us for uh, many more slides for many more shows, because we think it has something else that the Gensheim building didn't have to that extent uh, that you pushed yourself kind of the next level. And that plays into uh, the, the one on the bottom left is the show the longest show in the making of DeSoto and, and myself that maybe might be the most relevant because it's comparing skins. Uh, the first one that we're born with and the second one that we put on over uh, that. And the third one, only the third one is the one that we create around that, which we call facades or thresholds, building thresholds. And we look into you know the relationship of the two. The working title is Address Code, Address Code. Because again, mm -hmm. what we wear, you know, should have an implication on how we, as a society, decide how these fenestrations should be. And you know, this is this is an opening funny slide that shows both of us in our childhoods and how we were dressed. Uh, you know, me with this funny uh, cow like Holstein cow coat. You know, at a trip to <laughs> one of the the the, the regional uh, ski areas in northern Germany in the Harz. But it also shows me with my sister on the back of my dad uh, on our roof terrace in the summer with with being naked. And DeSoto is pointing out saying, hey, wasn't it you, uh, you know, howly uh, white guys who and specifically the Germans who got so overly obsessed with with nakedness and with nudity <laughs> and um you know um obviously in in a bad way the nazis got into that in this sort of obscured way but in a in a better way the the modern masters the Bauhaus, and and i and i argue with that you know walter gropius's um Bauhaus building in dessau or the fagos Werke and near closer to my hometown in hanover where your north lb is um, and is very much the attempt to be as naked as you can, because that skin is absolutely as dematerialized as it could have been and as was at that time, which was amazing. Again, we're talking like close to that hundred years ago, right? By the way, the, the year 27 around that time was the Fagos worker by 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 Gropius, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's I guess what all our contributions to this slide is about, these kind of three skins. So let's use the last uh, four minutes to jump at least into the very macro of that project that we're gonna show for many more uh, episodes. And that gets us to the next slide, which shows it uh, to us in its um, uh, plan, diagram, location, site location, explain us, please. Yeah, so this was a um, really, it was the, first of all, it's the, actually the largest project that our office ever participated in. It was the, um, this was like, these are some competition drawings from, uh, uh, what was at the time, an international design competition for a new science campus um, on at Harvard University here in, in Cambridge. Um, <clears throat> Basically, the idea being that um, the the land to the south of the Charles River, which you see kind of meandering through the middle of the, the picture on the left, uh, had been uh, over the 90s um, consolidated by Harvard as the site of a, of a kind of potential almost doubling of their existing campus in Cambridge. So the idea you know, at the time was to um, really build the campus of the future, find ways to enroll many, many more students at Harvard, provide more specialized facilities, and to drive that campus forward with um, a, a concept of, of science, and particularly in this case, it was was life sciences. So where this kind of orange dot is on the lower part of the of the slide on the on the left, um, that was sort of the the middle point of of the site, and we were asked to develop a variety of future development scenarios around that orange dot um, that would uh, ultimately lead up lead up to about three million square feet of of uh, research and laboratory facilities with the first portion being the first, the initial 1 million um, square feet. Yeah, and I wanna, with a uh, two remaining minutes, something that you said in, in such a sort of as if it would be natural, 
and a no-brainer. But in America, uh, that culture is very rare. That is the culture of architectural competitions. Mm. Mostly it's like, you know, if anything, it's like a couple of firms that get invited and they all submit proposals and the client picks the one that he, she likes the most, right? But that culture that is so inherent to the history of your firm, back to Stefan's father, Günther, with the Olympics in, in 72, that was a competition. Uh, you guys never stopped, although, you know, you made your name. So it could have easily said, OK, now we made it. Now we wait to be invited by these clients. And then we have a better chance because it's only going to be a few of us competing mm -hmm. against each other. No, you continue to stay true to that tradition of the firm, always competing with hundreds or thousands of people. The North LB in my hometown is another example that I shared in my introductory, the very first show that I was working for my professor at that time, and we were competing. And um, and you guys won, rightly so. Um, I I said then, and I will continue to say in, in in forever. So I think there's there's really this this amazing um, sort of ethics in your guys' firm to say. And again, we're not privileged, right? We're not we're not exclusive. We're inclusive. We want to basically. Uh, get this project by having been chosen as the best by a non-biased, anonymous jury that does not know it is us, right? Mm. Because we want to mm. be judged upon that the project is really the best project. And I really commend you guys for that. And this is something that America has to learn a lot from. Mm. And it's a very, it is a valuable process in the sense that you, not, it's important to know, you know, who you're working with and how you could work with them, but it's equally important to have an idea what might this what might this be, right? I mean, I think we've gotten away from the culture of select of thinking about what the most appropriate or the best design for a given project is, and more a little bit about you know how do we are can we be buddies with these people and can we have dinner with them after meetings and so forth, <laughs> which doesn't necessarily lead to the best outcome for a given site. No, it's it's a bad, good closing note, and I will just add to that. I think it's it's a win-win situation. It's 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 the client gets the best out of it, and you as an architect, it puts you in the better position because again, it's not like you sucked up and now you have to like beg or something. You can always say no. This was this was chosen by you as a client, trusted your esteemed jury that you put in place. So you wanted this, right? And so we have to follow through with what you wanted. Not what I want, because you bought into not even knowing who I was. So great. <laughs> Let's uh, get that message out to America to do this more. And the architects not being afraid, because if you have the best concept, you get chosen, as you guys tradition shows very well. So that is it for today, time-wise. We're going to continue with this and show in images how the you know the the situation the location looked like and how you guys approached it uh conceptually so looking much forward to that uh and until then still uh, stay easy breezy breezily easy no matter where you are in whatever way you need to do this at this time of the year all right and we will have to soto back with us next week that's the most to look forward to <laughs> All right. See you next week. Bye, Matt. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.